This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey everyone, welcome back to More Than Work. So my guest today is John El Maragi, and he is the director at Archangel Raphael's Mission, also called ARM, which I'll be sticking with because yep. I couldn't <laughs> say that twice now. So thanks for being here. No, thanks so much for having me. Cool. And so John, where am I talking to you from? So I live in Jersey City, so right outside of New York, but ARM operates primarily in central and north Jersey. So we go Probably about as south as the Jersey Shore, for those who are familiar, not from the television show, the real Jersey Shore. (laughs) And we go about as far north as basically where I live. So cover about a 30, 35 mile line across the central and northern part of New Jersey. Awesome. That's great. And did you grow up in New Jersey? Yep. Born in Jersey, raised in Jersey, and all indications are that I'll die in Jersey. (laughs) That's what it's seeming like. Yeah, no, it's it's cool, and I know you're right across from New York. I was definitely in Jersey City a few times when I when I lived over there. But what did you start out doing before you were working at ARM? So ARM actually started for me in college. So at the time, I was in the service industry, which I think definitely there's a, a connection there between kind of the hospitality component of what we like to offer at ARM. My wife and, well, my then girlfriend, but now wife and co-founder, also at college, also a hospitality professional at the time. And then after graduation, my wife ended up becoming a nurse. She's a nurse right now in New York, actually at the Mount Sinai Hospital. Mm-hmm. And I went on to a career originally in consulting, but then transitioned to the nonprofit sector, which is where I currently work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, they're a lot different for sure. Consulting and nonprofit. So when you went into consulting, were you doing business development or what kind of stuff were you doing there? Yeah. So I was working primarily in like borderline impact consulting. I call it impact consulting. So we were primarily doing commercialization and exposure work. So things like like pitch competitions, like very shark tanky things to Mm -hmm. highlight new and upcoming technology, specifically in the health space. And we would work for clients like the IFC, the World Bank, the City of New York, Robert Johnson Foundation. So very, you know, very nonprofit adjacent. But yeah, there was definitely a distinction between my consulting life and my nonprofit administration life. Mm -hmm. And then so what brought you to deciding to move into nonprofit? Well, you know, I think for me, that was always where I wanted to be. Like, actually, one of the reasons I left my consulting roles because the the makeup and culture of the company had had switched more towards traditional McKinsey-style consulting, where we would kind of just do management consulting and business administration and things like that. And I've often found that, you know, and I kind of sometimes call it a curse. I mean, it's a beauty and a curse, but I really can't work well, you know, at, at the level that I like to be producing work at unless I really believe in in the mission of the organization that I work that I work for. It doesn't necessarily have to be nonprofit, you know, it can be for profit, but you know, it really does have to be there has to be a mission alignment for me. And that's why I knew that if I if I transitioned into the nonprofit world, I would never have to worry about a, a culture shift like we had when I was in the consulting world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And especially as things have evolved over time, I mean people are looking for more meaningful or mission-driven work. And even in our lives, we try to be more intentional. Some of us. I won't say everybody. (laughs) Hopefully, yeah, exactly. That's the goal. Do you know what brought you to that kind of mindset? Just because I'm someone who relates very, very much to being service-minded and being of, of the thought that that kind of even mindset about working somewhere that you believe in their mission and values is important whether I do that or not all the time is another thing, but do you know what drove you to that kind of thinking and, and life? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that question. So, you know, for me, it was very much like a journey of self-discovery. So arm was kind of a expression of a, of a level of maturity that I hadn't reached up until that point. I was in college, actually, I think at the time that I, it's hard to remember that far back, but at the time, I believe I was actually working full time, having not graduated college. College had kind of gone to the wayside, and you know, I was I was kind of just focusing on living like a young bachelory life, going out, that kind of stuff. And, and I realized I had a moment of of self 
actualization where I was like, this is extremely selfish and uh, I could very easily go down the wrong road here. And it kind of brought up the the conundrum of, well, a lot of folks who end up like me and are lucky enough to progress professionally and folks who don't, the deciding factor is usually just a support system. Mm. So that's where we kind of, the initial thought behind ARM was, well, can we be a support to people in our community that maybe don't have as significant of a, of a support system. So it was it was definitely an expression of growth and an expression of appreciation for the, for the position that I'm in and, and the ability for us to affect change like that. Mm. Yeah, and that's a big insight to get, especially kind of at the age you were at too, because I think it's yeah. hard to recognize. <laughs> I mean, what is often labeled as privilege or you know, luck sure. or different things like that, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you know, it, it really comes down to luck. I mean, you know, I had friends in similar familial financial circumstances that 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 experienced a significantly more hardship. And I had, you know, friends who didn't have as as much circumstances go on to, to be very successful. So, you know, for me, it really was a realization that a, a support system is in my opinion, more of a privilege than having money in your bank account. There's little that you can't do with people behind you. Mm -hmm. And so besides being an inexplicable tongue twister for me, there's no reason it should be. What is ARM? Yeah, no, it is. It's, It's impossibly long. We always make jokes about that ourselves. So at the time when we started ARM, it actually grew out of an existing church outreach or service. So I kind of got connected to this group after having this realization and kind of it kind of more and more became my responsibility as folks moved or got married or you know their life took them on a different course and at a certain point we realized that it was it was important to spin off but before that um all church programs within our parish at least needed to have like a patron saint and so Mm -hmm. ours was archangel Raphael, and who is the patron saint of healing but that's where the name comes from Oh, cool. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. It's like easy for you to say. I don't know why I kept, I kept thinking Michael, there's one called Michael, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, I'm by no means a theologian. There's, there's, they are a couple archangels. I think I want to say, I want to say there's either four or six. I could be wrong there, but yeah, there, there are multiple. I mean, Archangel Raphael happened to be the one that was a patron saint of healing. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I don't know why I'm going to have to look up Michael because it's been in my head like (laughs) the whole day for some reason, knowing we were going to have this conversation and so (laughs) so right now are you guys a nonprofit that's not affiliated with the parish or are you still part of the parish yeah that's a great question and that's another thing that one of the main reasons we go by arm is because especially where we are here in like central and north jersey you know organizations with religious sounding names tend to be automatically associated with evangelistic organizations Mm -hmm. which we're not you know my wife and i are christian but we have atheist members we have you know, Muslim members, like no, nothing that we do is inherently evangelistic. And, and so it's, that's one of the main reasons we do go by arm because we want people to get the right impression of us. There's nothing wrong with evangelistic organizations. I just, it's just not what we do. Right. That being said though, we do receive a lot of support still from our church community. So mm-hmm. I'm a member of the Coptic Orthodox Church in New Jersey and a lot of folks there are very generous and very loving people and they continue to support us and we definitely appreciate their support. Yeah, for sure. And so what do you guys do as an organization? Yeah, so we primarily focus on health and hygiene interventions through the lens of hygiene and dignity. So initially, when we had first started, it was really more food service oriented. So making sandwiches, we always like to joke that we started making sandwiches on the hood of my Subaru, which was very not, you know, health code appropriate. But, (laughs) you know, we've since we've since learned we don't really do as much food service or it's really it doesn't comprise like the center of what we do anymore. That being said, we are part of a feeding agency in town. We are one of a number of agencies that engage in that kind of behavior. But our, you know, hero services or our primary services revolve around two major programs. The first one is the big one, the shiny one. This is our mobile shower program. Mm -hmm. So we have a trailer with two shower stalls in it. We provide free hot showers to folks in need. And similarly along those veins, everything for us is mobile oriented. We also have a mobile barber shop that we just launched this year. Oh, amazing. Um, Yeah, which is super exciting. So it's a three chair 
mobile barber shop that we're able to pull into you know the exact same places that we'd be pulling in for showers so we're we're looking at probably alternating those services throughout the the summer so we primarily operate in the warm weather months so from about early june through to mid october mm -hmm. and how did you come up with the idea that this is the way to go and i'll just say like, i live in a part of london that you know we do have a an unhoused community for sure all over the U.S. you're seeing this. I mean, I'm from California. I lived in San Diego for years. That It's a major thing there. But mm -hmm. So there are, like you said, people handing out sandwiches all the time. But how did you come to decide that showers were the way to go and now haircuts? And so for us, we initially had started with, you know, food service. And at the time, Rutgers had like a very vibrant food truck culture. And so we thought it'd be kind of cool to get like a mobile food truck, like a mobile soup kitchen, which is still innovative, but much mm -hmm. more common throughout the world. And actually, my wife saw this video of another organization at West that kind of, I would say, if not started, popularized the idea of mobile showers. They're called Lava May. She saw that video about four or five years ago. Over the last four years, we kind of shifted that focus towards showers. And like you mentioned before as well, you know, we really like the idea of being able to do something that wasn't replicated in the community. There's a lot of social work organizations. There's a lot of housing organizations. There's a lot of food organizations. There's effectively zero hygiene focused organizations mm -hmm. in our area. And so it was an, it was an, an awesome opportunity for us to provide a, a needed service, a service that wasn't currently being facilitated, and also allowed us the freedom to partner with a lot of organizations without existing in a competitive space. So it was kind of a win-win-win. And so what impact are you seeing this have on people? Because I can imagine just not being able to shower. Is, I mean, if you go on a trip like overseas and you get off the plane, you want to take a shower. So that has to be a really big impact on someone not being able to do that. Funny enough, I've actually been talking to a lot of people about The Last of Us for this. So, the, you know, the oh, yeah. popular zombie. Yeah, and yeah. there's like a number of episodes in this series or in season one where like a character finds out that there's running water and that they mm -hmm. can take a shower and they are like blown away, you know. And so it's it it really creates that same experience. And I'm so glad that really good actors and and writers have kind of included this multiple times throughout the series. So I encourage it. I don't, I'm not paid by HBO. I wish I was, but <laughs> I, I encourage everyone to, to go watch the last of us specifically. I think it was episode three that like the one that everyone's like very yeah. emotionally touched by. There's a, there's a, a portion there where a character is like offered a hot shower and it's like, it's very invigorating for them. It's really the same experience that we see every day. You know, I always like to say, a shower is not going to change someone's life, but it is going to change their day and it's mm -hmm. going to make them feel supported in the community, especially as we look at this from a like a cause area perspective. There is an importance of creating more availability for hygiene in our community. So showers are a very obvious one, but like I hate the idea of like locked bathrooms. So like, you know, yeah. bathrooms for paying customer only. There are all of these kind of ways that we can discriminate against people who lack hygiene access in our community so that the shower is kind of the hero product, so to speak. But really the goal is to get people to understand the importance of cross access for hygiene because there are moments where we need it. I can't tell you how many times I've been out. I have my huge hydro flask here. I really need to use yeah. the restroom. And because I look the way that I look, there's really few restrooms that are off limits to me, to be perfectly honest. But if I look yeah. differently, that'd be a different story. Yeah, that's true. And and just the idea, too. I mean, this one pub I go to, they always let people use the, the toilet there. And I'm not going to say which one because I don't want everyone running there. Not that I have that many <laughs> listeners. And I asked the manager that one time. I'm all, I just said, you know, I go, it's cool that you guys do that because not everywhere does. And he's like, well, more often than not, it's just someone who can't find a place to go and they need to go. So it's better they go here then go on the street which a lot of people do or basically just have a health issue eventually or something and it's interesting to me that it's such a basic thing but then I've, I've been in that situation where I'm like well, where can I go I have to go now you just mentioning that that makes it more relatable I think no it's so true and and like the like the owner of that pub mentioned there's this philosophy or there's the this belief that if you make certain things illegal or off limits they just disappear and it's just not true you're only going to have cascading issues associated with that whether it's that person is now going to relieve themselves on your property yeah. or that person is going to re relieve themselves publicly and then they're going to get 
in, in tr- I don't know what the rules are over there in the UK, but it's a pretty serious offense to get caught relieving yourself yeah. in public here in the States. And, uh, you know, again, we talk about cascading effects. You could have someone who's right there on the cusp of, of being okay and self-sufficient and they get a court date and then they have to pay for a lawyer and then they miss their court date. These things spiral very quickly and it's, it's the rule, not the exception most times, unfortunately. Yeah, totally. And how are you staffing the mobile showers and then how are you staffing the, the haircut arm of it too? Yeah. So the so the the haircut components. So we have like on our board, we actually have two owners of a barber shop. So oh, that's wow. obviously extremely helpful. And they've been, in addition to their general excitement for our work overall, they've obviously been particularly excited about the barber shop component. Yeah. So we, we generally work with them or other barber shops that provide professional barbers. That's definitely a big rule for us that whatever service we're offering, we're utilizing a professional. Mm-hmm. And then we rely very heavily on volunteers. You know, every every setup will usually engage at least three volunteers, three to five volunteers over the course of three to five hours for a setup, maintaining the area, keeping it clean, managing the line, cleaning out the, the shower. So we clean every shower after every use. So everyone's walking into a nice clean shower. And then we also hire a part-time employee to manage our programs in the summer. I'd love to make it a full-time employee. Fingers crossed that that, that could become the case eventually. But right now we're, we're utilizing part-time labor to do kind of the towing and the maintenance and, you know, kind of working with the heavy equipment, essentially. Yeah, that's great, though. And it's like creating a job for someone, opportunity for people to volunteer, and then, of course, helping people in the community. Have you gotten feedback from people directly who have used the your programs and just what they've said about it and, you know, kind of affirmation that... Yeah, this was something that was needed. Yeah, yeah. There's always a couple that stick with you. There was one guest. So Fridays is when we provide services in New Brunswick, and he's a New Brunswick guest. And he goes, Fridays are the day. He's like, this is my day to shower. He's like, you know, I have to lock myself in a bathroom otherwise. So just the, like, people plan their day around it. And it's, unfortunately, it's sad. But at the same time, it's also very touching to know that we've become such a big part of this person's life because of the service we're able to provide them that they, they build their schedule around us. If other people say kind of like what you typically would expect someone who hasn't had access, that feels great. I feel so refreshed. Even visually, you'll see someone, they walk in, they're a little grumpy. Obviously, they might have had a hard day up until this point. They walk out. They look like a million pounds was lifted off their chest. It's a, it's a really great and transformative experience, especially the, the haircuts. I mean, the haircuts are literally visually yeah. transformative. They sit down in a chair... 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, they literally look like a different person. So it's all great feelings. And we're very happy to have very positive feedback from our guests about the services. Yeah, I've seen even like on TikTok or something like someone get a haircut and the change in them and just their demeanor and how they can carry themselves because they just they do feel different and they do feel more, I'm sure, human in a way. Right. Because I think that's one hundred percent big thing like you like I like that you called the people guests. You know, and just kind of seem to talk about them in a way that gives dignity where a lot of people don't, you know. Thank you. Yeah, that's very important for us. You know, we we always use very hospitality focused language. So guests, services, offerings. We always try to frame things as a just like you would when you go to a hotel, right? When you go to a hotel, people are thanking you the entire time that you're there. They're asking you what they can do for you. You know, I mean, like in a pipe dream, I'd love to hire someone from like hardcore hospitality background eventually to to run some of the programming for what we do because that's definitely, we always say we want to facilitate as close to a spa-like experience as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you picking up on that because it is a, a major component of our work. And we've noticed that there are, you know, we're obviously not the only folks that do this in our communities and uh, I, I would hazard to say we're the favorite. And I think a lot of the reason that we're the favorite is because of the way that we treat folks. It's not mm-hmm. just here, use it, you know, be thankful that it's here kind of thing. You really, you're thanking people for joining you. You're thanking mm-hmm. people for supporting your work. You're thanking people for trusting you because it's a very intimate thing. You know, it's, it's easy to go to a soup kitchen and you grab your food and you're on, you're on the go. You could, there's a lot of, you can make up a story of like, oh, you know, I forgot my lunch at home or something. It's a very yeah. intimate thing for someone to admit that they do need access to a shower 
power. And so mm-hmm. you have to you have to really be cognizant of that in the way that you provide services to people. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. That was really that's a good insight. And so John, when you look at your career and you switched from consulting to nonprofit and then you're doing a lot of work with ARM as well. First of all, what was the transition like to go from consulting to nonprofit? And can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space now? Yeah, so you know, when when I initially had moved over from consulting work, so this was about three and a half years ago, I went from essentially project management consulting. So a lot of I, a lot of what I was doing was operating programs mm-hmm. for sponsoring agencies to fundraising. And in that role, it was a lot more writing. You know, I definitely miss the interpersonal. So it wasn't like, I basically never had a call on my calendar. Mm-hmm. My ca- The whole day, my calendar was just writing grants, writing grants, writing grants, writing grants. And I, I think I, I definitely got, I, I got sick of it, to be perfectly honest. And, <laughs> um, I ended up moving back into the operations side of things as a volunteer director. And, and then that was great because that was all ops. I was in the field three to five days a week. It was very, very engaging. But then also I, uh, I missed the fundraising component. And so in my, my most current role that I moved into earlier this year, I have the, the pleasure of kind of combining both of those. So I do uh, corporate fundraising for mm-hmm. a volunteer agency. And so what I do is it's a lot of kind of sales and fundraising, person-to-person fundraising, calling people, managing relationships. But then there's also a component of being in the field, making sure people are happy with the the service that they've invested in, in the nonprofit. So it's a nice combo Um, and very, very different from the for-profit world in that regard. You know, in the Mm -hmm. for-profit world, it's it's primarily based around very strict timetables. You're a lot more kind of at the mercy, for lack of a better term, of your client. In the nonprofit world, there's a lot more partnership oriented work, which is nice. So there's you're a little bit more of an equal partner in that regard. And I definitely appreciate that. I don't like the idea categorically. I mean, across life, I don't like the idea of one group having, you know, a ton of power over another group. I'm more Mm -hmm. of an equality oriented person. And so in the nonprofit sector, when it comes to corporate partnerships, you really are kind of working together as partners to achieve a mutual goal of your choosing. So in this case, it would be volunteer events. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's cool that you were able to, you've been able, now I'm a project manager by trade also. I've transitioned out of that role myself, but that's, I think once you are one, that's what you, you are. You're always one. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It doesn't, doesn't change you. Your brain doesn't change that much, but I think it's cool that you've been able to apply that to go into nonprofit space and then also for your career, but then also as a volunteer. And one thing I want to ask you about, because you've mentioned a couple of times that you rely on volunteers for quite a bit, and then you yourself are one. And one thing I try to tell people is whatever capacity you have to give, people will be able to accept that from you if you can give it. And I think you're a good example of showing that people might just be cleaning the showers or they might be doing what you're doing, which is a more director role. And so... What's your experience been both as a volunteer and working with volunteers? And do you agree with what I've said, basically? I mean, yeah, I agree 100 percent. You know, I would say and I would also say that, you know, for folks who are looking to volunteer, really think through it in terms of how you want to impact the world. Like what I always find is like you get a lot of entrepreneurs in in some kind of social space because they have a very specific picture of what they want to do. And you actually can find a volunteer, almost to a T, you can find a volunteer role that will give you that experience if you do your homework on like, okay, what cause area am I interested in? What kind of volunteer engagement am I interested in? Are you the kind of person that likes washing feet, for lack of a better term? Are you kind of on the road? You want to do the dirty job? Or do you want to do what you do as a professional for a nonprofit? For example, something that I would love is someone like me who has a fundraising background that can join me on the fundraising side, right? And that requires skill and it also requires time. And that's another thing too is are you looking to do one-off volunteer engagements, a couple hours here, a couple hours there? Or are you looking to do a long service with one agency? Are you looking to become an advisory board member or someone that's really built into the volunteer staff of the agency? I can say from personal experience that if you can think it, 
your nonprofit of choice probably needs it, even big ones. We're just so talent starved in the nonprofit space because there are a lot of societal expectations. I actually just saw an article on LinkedIn about how they, I forget who it was, but they did a study and they said that nonprofits really should be spending close to 30% of their income on operate on admin in order to really accomplish their goal. Mm -hmm. And the societal expectation is about a third of that. So they, they usually say people start to to give a weird look on your financials. If you're doing more than 10% administrative costs. So, Mm -hmm. so volunteering is a great way to kind of get in the middle of that and say, Hey, listen, I'm an accountant. I can do your books for you. It takes an accountant almost nothing to do to have one more client as as a bookkeeping client, and it yeah. means the world to a nonprofit. So whether it's you getting involved individually or getting whatever your firm is involved, that's a huge way to make a massive difference in whatever cause area you care about. Yeah, no, that's great. So, John, one thing I like to ask everybody who's on the podcast is, like, do you have any advice or mantra that you want to share with people? Just something maybe that you follow or something you you think is important for them to think about? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say something to think about is something that I like to think about is always how can I provide a more dignified experience? So whether that's having a... I think about people in traffic. When you're sitting in traffic and there are folks that are panhandling, asking for money or supplies or whatever, you know, how, how can you have a more dignified experience with this person instead of just looking down at your phone or pulling your car up, which we've all been guilty of, by the way. I'm not, I'm not here to judge people. But a couple things that I, I have tried to challenge myself to do in a situation like that would be opening the window and saying, hey, man, I'm sorry I don't have anything, but I hope you have a great day. It's free. It's easy. It affirms the dignity of the person that you're dealing with. Another thing that my cousin likes to do, which I love, he takes, he makes care packages with his wife and he keeps a couple in his car at all times. If you're not the kind of person that likes to give out money, I don't really get involved in that debate, money or goods, but the important thing is that you're offering someone something that might be helpful for them. Uh, So that would be, that would be my mantra or thing to think about. How can you always make this experience more dignified for the person that you're working with? Nice. That's great. Well, thanks. And the last set of questions I have are called the fun five. And they're just questions I ask every guest that have nothing to do with (laughs) what they do or how important our conversation just was. So first one, what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? I actually have a hand-me-down from my uncle and that is his high school football, like a, like a championship shirt. Like it lists all the years that they were champions. And I want to say that was from 74. So it's got, got, yeah, is that, is that 60 years? Is that 50 years? Well, that's 50, 50 years old. It'd be 49 yeah. years old. Yeah. 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 Cause I was going to say that's getting close to my age and I'm like, I'm not 60. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. That's great. If every day was Groundhog's day, what song would you have your alarm clock set to play every morning? So back when my car used to like automatically play the first song in my library, Yes. Uh, no matter what. And I, I'm so glad that car manufacturers have figured that that, that is not a good system. <laughs> it was A-Punk by Vampire Weekend. And it's nice and upbeat. So I guess, I mean, I don't know how many times I could listen to that every single day for the first time. But it would definitely wake me up. And it, for at least the first couple times, it would put me in a good mood. Awesome. Yeah, that is so, so annoying. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And this one is coffee or tea or neither. Oh, well, okay. So technically for me, it's energy drinks, but those are very bad for you. And I don't recommend people drinking energy drinks. (laughs) So my second would be coffee. So that's the one that I'm trying to make my first. Nice. Well, what energy drink do you prefer though, if you're going to go that way? So I was like borderline addicted to Red Bull. Mm. I would have two Red Bulls a day because that was the deal. And that's how they get you. It's two for two for five. Oh yeah. So you just, you, you start off your day, you get to, you drink two whatever um so for me it was red bull it was um and uh i haven't had a red bull since that was my new year's resolution no more red bull so i'm completely off red bull but i will from time to time drink a celsius i do like you know they claim to be slightly healthier i don't know how true that is but that's that's the one that i'm drinking now whenever i do need an energy drink gotcha all right yeah that's wow so you had had a lot of wings for a while (laughs) yeah 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 i was winged out (laughs) (laughs) nice all right. Can you think of something that just makes you just crack up, like laugh so hard you cry or just kind of, 
I don't know, even chuckle to yourself when you think of it or the last time that happened to you? Yeah. In general, dad jokes. I love dad jokes. Whenever one pops into my head, I just, I laugh to myself. You know, it's, I love them. I could live for them. Yeah. Nice. All right. So the last question is who inspires you right now? So we have a, a couple volunteers in the organization who, um, they're probably about 20 or 21. I'm 31 as a, okay. as a comparison. So I'm about a decade older than these kids and um, these young adults, excuse me. And they are like, they hound me with ideas and ways to make the organization better. And like, whenever I think this is all too much, it's time to just focus on my professional life. It's, it's these young idealistic people who take as much time as they possibly can to make the world a better place uh, an inspiration to me. Nice. That's awesome. It's really cool to hear. And so just to close out, where do you want people to find you? Or if you just want them to look up the organization, what, where do you want people to go online and what would you like them to do if there's an action you'd like them to take? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, obviously we'd never say no to a donation, but honestly just getting involved following us, learning more about the organization. So the best way to do that, we are at Arm Gives on all of your favorite social media profiles. So Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and if and our website is arm.gives. So very easy to remember, you know, connect with us, come say hi. We actually have a couple of events going on. We have a, a mixer series going on through the summer and then we have a like a panel discussion event going on in november so if you're around and you want to join in visit arm.gives or arm gives on your favorite social platform awesome well thanks a lot for being on more than work john i really appreciate it no thanks for having me i appreciate you inviting us on thanks for listening you can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show, and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at, at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok, and the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.